Thanks for joining the Abide YouTube channel. For more information about Abide, go to AbideChurchFL.com and enjoy today's message. Good morning. We're going to get right into the Word if you guys want to open up to Isaiah 40. How many of you are ready for the Word this morning? I just came back from New York. We were with Tori Harper. Um, who leads Global Prayer Room NYC and Habitation Church. And they spent four days just seeking the face of the Lord together. They did 24 hours of nonstop, unbroken worship with people from all over, the, all over the boroughs of New York. You ain't never heard people pray so gangster in your whole life. It's like, it sounds good, but they sound angry. But it was just amazing to be up there for 24 hours. And I'm just, I, wanna, I always want to keep before you what the Lord is doing because God is doing amazing things throughout the whole earth. How many of you know this? It's not just like in our church community, look, all these people that are going to be part of our community, it's, it's everywhere. But I want to expand our, our understanding that what God's doing is bigger than abide. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than you. It is worldwide. Say amen. amen. In the midst of that, I want to invite us into something as a community. I feel personally like the next 77 days of my life may be the most important 77 days ever. I'm not saying that hyperbolically, like to get, I'm just saying, I feel like we're in a window right now where God is divinely inviting us into the depths of the realities of his person that we've never seen or experienced before. Now you're like, I don't even know what that means. Here's what I'm trying to say. I feel like there's more of God available right now than there has ever been before. For those of you that you have gotten away with the Lord, you know that when you go into that secret place, there's just something special that is happening. But it's not just happening individually, it's happening corporately. As we gather and we begin to magnify the name of the Lord, the Lord just settles in and he begins to deal, deliver, heal, restore, renew all of it. Because we're in a divine window of the Lord's presence where he is inviting us to places we've never been, to sing songs that have never been sung, to experience things we've never experienced before. How many of you want that? Man, you are here on spring break week with, with, a, with an hour of lost sleep, but you're here. And you're here because you're hungry. Because there's something in your heart that is like, man, I want more than just going through life and going through the motions. I want all that God has for me. How many of you feel that? Good. And I believe that in this hour, God is raising up a certain kind of person. It's not just a certain kind of church or a house. It is a certain kind of person that he is raising up. So I want to speak a little bit today about the forerunner spirit and what I believe God is leading us into. And for some of us, this is new language, but I just want to say this today is for whosoever. It's not an isolated certain people that God chooses. It is a whosoever wants to come, come. It is, a, it, is, it is available for everyone. Say all. all. I want you to catch this because I know that when we begin to speak and invite people to a different way of life, automatically people start to exclude themselves. Well, I can't do that, man, because you don't understand. I've got this going on. I've got that going on. I'm not as anointed as this person. I, don't, I just started off in this thing. I don't know, but I'm saying for all of us as a people, whether this is your first time or you've been rocking with us for five years, I'm telling you, God is inviting us as a spiritual family to make way for the King of glory. Not just to come to church and be church attendees. We are first and foremost priests before the Lord. And our priestly service before God, as we minister to him, as we worship, as we make space, it makes way in your family, in the region, in the church, for the king of glory to enter in. And we just, we just quoted it over and over again. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. There is a dimension of access to God that is, it, it is so special. It is pure. It is holy. So I feel this, man. We're going to be, over this next season, between now and Pentecost Sunday, we're going to be inviting you guys to live a radical lifestyle for God. In the area of giving, in the area of prayer, in the area of fasting, we're going to lock in here for 21 days. We're going to be open 12 hours a day for 21 days. We're locking in because we feel the invitation of the Holy Spirit saying, I have more for you. Not to have more gifting, more anointing, more, more status, more, I, I, all that's good. God, God's okay with that. But he's saying, I have more of myself that I want to give to you. How yeah. I many of you know the, gay, the greatest gift a friend could give you is access to himself. 
You could have all the language in the world, man. We're bros, we're friends, but it doesn't become a reality until I give you access to who I am as a person. We know that we've really hit the level of friendship whenever we start entering into intimate fellowship at a relational level. In this next season, God is wanting to reveal himself to you like never before. I'm telling you, as you open up your Bible, mark my words, as you open up your Bible in this place of prayer and engaging with them, it's going to open up like never before. We begin to pray, God, give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. And the scriptures begin to unlock and open themselves up. And it becomes food for us. I think it was like 2016, 2015, somewhere around that. It could have been a little bit later. I was driving. And at this point in my life, I had been saved for about five or six years. And I was actually in an interesting time in my life. Um, when I got saved, I went through a three-year program. I had been a drug addict. And I got launched right into ministry working at a, at a big church, and, and all of that kind of went away for a season, and I found myself doing things. And so in this season, I was working at AutoZone, just so excited to have a job, kind of newly been married for a while. But, but how many of you know, I quickly realized that everybody who walks into AutoZone is angry. <laughs> Nobody happy walks into AutoZone. It is the place for automobile dysfunction. <laughs> and so I, I, like, I, I need a better spot. So I was doing commercial driving, and oftentimes as I was delivering things places, the Lord would speak to me. I'll never forget being in that great truck and God speaking to me about a company of people he was raising up. And honestly, at this time in my life, I was dealing with a lot of, a lot of hopelessness because how many of you know, you gotta be careful from what place you eat. There's lots of opportunities for you to eat from lots of different things, meaning you can go to the news, you can eat from that, from that table, you can go to certain groups and eat from that. And wherever you begin to set yourself at that table, the food you begin to consume begins to affect you, just like in the natural. If all you do is feed yourself garbage, you're going to reap what you sow. Well, it was in a season in my life where I was struggling and I was listening to certain voices. And in the midst of this, I felt like God met me in that truck. And we were youth pastoring. I just want to tell you, I am not anointed to youth pastor. It was rough all the way around. And in the midst of that, God's like, man, I remember I'm driving and I, I'm, I'm in Coco. Cocoa Beach area, and the Lord says, man, I'm raising up a generation of uncompromising revivalists who first and foremost love Jesus. They're no longer going to work out of obligation. I was weeping. They're no longer working out of obligation or trying to attain something, but they will lay down their lives every day because they have found the pearl of great prize. Yeah. This has become real to them. It's not that we don't want to do all the things that God has called us to do. It's not that we don't want to have dreams, passions, and desires, but this one thing has become the main thing. Now, we talk about this so much here. Sometimes it just, it just kind of goes over our head because it becomes a language. The one thing paradigm and Jesus coming and us making ourselves ready for the coming of the Lord and the great and terrible day. But I just want to say over and over again, this is real. The Lord is real. It's not some sort of fairy tale, us going through the motions and just trying to live a better. This is real. Like one day there will be a God who will come to establish his throne here forever and we will stand before him. And what he's doing in this hour, I want to bring us back into the narrative, he is raising up people who are sounding the alarm. Make way for the king of glory because he's coming. Before Jesus came, there was a man called John the Baptist who Isaiah 40 would prophesy about him as a forerunner. And that's what I want to read. Isaiah 40 verse 3 says this, There is a voice of one calling out, Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Remove the obstacles. Make straight and smooth in the desert a highway for our Lord. Every valley shall be raised and every mountain and hill will be made low. And let the rough ground become plain and the rugged place a broad valley. And the glory, say glory, glory. and majesty and splendor of the Lord will be revealed. Come on. The glory, the majesty, and the splendor of the Lord will be revealed. And all, say all. All humanity will see it together. This is what is coming. Where God raises up a company of people, it's, a, it's not just a certain type of, of identification. It is a way of life. It's interesting, especially in the charismatic world, we glory in us being a peculiar people. But for a people who are peculiar, there's so much sameness going on. It's like everybody wants to look, talk, and act. And I'm saying, God, where are the company, the remnant company of people that are going the opposite way of society and of culture? And they're not, are you alive? Yeah. Yeah. They're going against the grain. 
where it's starting to challenge people's way of life and conviction. Where we're not trying, like Tyler said, we're not begging people to give. We are a generous kingdom people. God does not own 10% of my money. God owns 100% of my money. God doesn't just get two hours on Sunday. He has my life. You see how this is a different way? Now, you can, how many of you know you can work 40, 50 hours a week and God can still have your life? We're not minimizing marketplace. We're not saying quit your job and go all in for Jesus. You can go all in for Jesus at T-Mobile. Wherever you work, you can go all the way in and live a fully abandoned life. The question we have to answer is, how much access to your heart does he really have? These forerunners in this remnant, what is a remnant? A remnant of people are, the, are those who remain after everybody else has scattered. The Bible is clear, there will be a great apostasy. Meaning there will be a, 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 a horde of people, many, not just a few, many people who will walk away from the original truth of the gospel. Truth is not relative. It's not a feeling. Truth is truth. Truth is not based off of a feeling. If I feel it or don't feel it or if it makes me feel, truth is truth. And in the midst of a society whose Lord and God is our feelings, Many will be offended and disappointed with the Lord and his leadership in the age to come. And so I want to anchor us into this narrative. Listen, you may be struggling with gross sin issues. You may have walked in, you're like, I just need a little bit of hope. I, I, I feel disappointed and broken. The greatest solution for you in this season is to go all in with Jesus. The remedy is not the touch of a man, but the touch of the man. And him having your full heart and you going on, like, I don't even know how to do that. That's okay. There's so much grace on this journey of following Jesus, but make, make no mistake, it is about us following him. For all that we talk about Jesus pursuing us, he is the great pursuer. But in this season, I want to talk to you today about your pursuit of him. What does it look like for you to be a forerunner who goes before everyone else? How many of you know? Even though Isaiah 40 prophesied about a man who was coming to make way for the king of glory, the people who, who should have been most prepared, being the Sadducees and the Pharisees who had studied all of Isaiah and all of the Old Testament, the ones who should have known the most that he was coming were most offended by him. They call him a demon-possessed man. They said all kinds of vile things about John because the Lord and his leadership will often come in a way that offends you to see if you could still lead into the narrative. So what does it mean for us in this season as a community to be a forerunner? This is what God is, he is depositing in us the forerunner spirit where we go places we've never gone. I wanna say, I just feel this. We've gotta start singing songs that have never been sung. I love Upper Room, I love, I love all of the songs, but I want to sing what heaven is singing. When Jesus says, I have friends and I want to reveal my, my secrets to my friends, I want to hear his secrets. I want to read the scripture and, 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 and understand things I've never understood. How many of you want this? I, this is available for us right here, and, and I'm saying the time for us to play games is over. It's over. It's interesting what is happening in the church because there was a season in the church where they would have called it the attractional church where they built churches in a way that was so attractive to you that hopefully one day you would actually really say yes to Jesus on the back end. And so thousands of people would gather and what God is doing in this age is he's destroying that model. I mean, people who are in that realm of church are even saying it's just not working anymore because God is dwindling us to him and only him. There's so much I want to preface before I even tell you the identity of, because you have to understand where we're at. Jesus rebuked the people of the time. He said, you did not discern. You did not properly discern what was happening. So for us, man, us operating within a realm of the kingdom starts with us discerning where we are really at. Not falling asleep or growing cold and in slumber. So Matthew 24, let's turn there. Matthew 24, I want to start in verse 3 if you want to turn. I want you to see it. Jesus sat on Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately. Tell us what, when all this will happen. 
What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? How many of you know the world's not just going to end? Jesus is coming back to establish his dominion forevermore. It's not just ending. He's coming to establish his kingdom here. So he's talking about what, what's going to happen before his coming. When he's coming to, to a bride who is made ready without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Jesus told, said, do not let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. And they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats and rumors of wars, but do not panic, yet these things must take place. But the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. How many of you know with birth pains, there is a birthing? Do you hear what I'm saying? The birth pains and what we are experiencing is not just unto birth pains. How weird would it be if you would go through nine months of a baby growing and the birth pain at the hospital, but nothing ever came out. Birth pains precede birthing. And I want to say, prophetically, we are in the birthing canal right now. God is birthing something in his church. Whether you realize it or not, God has us in a place of birthing. It's uncomfortable, it's messy, but something will be birthed through all of this that you are going through. Even right now, I feel like, man, some of the pressure and the things you're going through, it is producing and birthing something. It's not unto nothing. Can you hear what I'm saying to you? Verse 9, you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. I know it's, it's not sexy, I know, but it's, it's the Bible. This is what's coming. This is why I say, if we don't understand this, when things happen, we will be offended at his coming and disappointed. Sin will run rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But, say but. But the one who endures to the end will be saved and the good news of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and the end will come. So here's the great paradox. There's great darkness, people being persecuted. The love of many will grow cold, but in the midst of that, there will be a company of people, a remnant, a forerunner crew that will take the gospel message and the good news across the whole earth. Say that's me. You may not even believe that, but I want to prophesy to you. This is you. We're not waiting for a church to be the vehicle whereby revival comes. We become the people and the company that say we're going the Lord's way no matter what. Come what may, I'm going that way. Doesn't matter what things look like. Doesn't matter what's being said. The word of the Lord becomes the plumb line. Therefore, we know, hopefully by the time this 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 age approaches, you would have heard Matthew 24 so many times from this pulpit that you would say, oh, we've talked about this. This isn't a time to flee, to run. Or none, of the, none of us should be afraid of this. I just want to say to you, a people whose hearts are fully devoted to Jesus cannot be threatened by experiencing and transitioning to glory forevermore. You cannot threaten me with eternity with Jesus. Uh, you're, you're not ready for that. that. That's like a four week from now message. Not ready for that message yet. I get it. I felt it. So, so sin, again, sin will run rampant everywhere. The love of many will grow cold. How many of you know you could look out now and feel that? This is, you don't got to be a prophet to see what's going on in the world. But what I really want you to see as a greater reality is in the midst of that, God is looking for a people. He's like, who will be those that in the age will carry my kingdom, my love, my presence to the darkest places? And it becomes a promise to us that as we go to these places, to these regions, to these streets, to these jobs, to the workplace, that the, the message of the kingdom will go forth in power. How many of you know the Bible says his word will not return void? That when we preach the kingdom of God is near, and we demonstrate the kingdom. It never returns void. It may not play out the way we want it to play out, but it never, say never. never. It never returns void. So our job is to be faithful to the assignment. And in the midst of the great falling away, we don't fall into the social norm. What is the social norm? We live in a day where preachers and people now teach that holiness is a thing of the past. 
this is the reality. This is the state of the church. That there's grace and you could do whatever you want. There's grace for that, bro. We're all walking in weakness. Instead of raising the bar and saying, no, the Holy Spirit gives us the grace and the gift to walk in holiness and purity and righteousness. It doesn't get a lot of amens, I know. But I'm telling you, this company of people, Psalm 101.3, I will set my eye on no evil or worthless or corrupt thing. Psalm 101.3, I will set my eye on no evil, worthless, or corrupt thing. He's raising up a company like, no, we're going back to the ways of Jesus. We're not worried about trying to fit in. I don't care what people think about my social. I don't, worthless. I'm trying to go the Lord's way. We're not putting the Holy Spirit in the back room and hoping that we go to some spiritual retreat so people can be delivered. No, here and now. We're giving the Holy Spirit leadership again in our church and saying, Holy Spirit, where do you want to go? What do you want to sing? What do you want to do? We're going to spend hours in rooms reading the Word and praying in the Spirit, strengthening our inner man, not just for when people can see us, but so that when the adversary comes, like we talked about last week as the accuser, we can stand in confidence. (laughs) Oh, are you with me? I'm trying to envision you right now for what I believe the Lord is doing. It's time where we, we have diminished the apostolic ministry to an entrepreneurial pursuit and approach. Where we become more CEOs than fathers. These are the things that God is restoring. A church that is more worried about offending people than God. But this day is coming to an end. And in the midst of all of that, I just want to say to you, God is raising his people up. Mark my words. He's raising his people up. I'm not just interested in building a ministry. I want my son to grow up in a church where we have taught a gospel and a message where we stand and we don't compromise. You guys remember the story in Daniel 3 about the three little boys? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego where the nation had gone corrupt, the Babylonians, there was so much going on in the midst of that. Somebody had discipled their kids in such a way that when Nebuchadnezzar came on the scene and created a statue of himself, how many of you know there's a lot of that going on in the world right now? Everything in the world isn't just happening by happenstance, people. Everything is trying to get you to bow. It's worship. It's idolatry. It's a system that is trying to distract you, deter you, and give and multiply your heart in a thousand different ways. And God is a jealous lover who will share his affection with no one. (laughs) Jealous lover. Now, for those of you that are married, could you imagine your spouse like, man, I really like you, but I really, there's this other person. (laughs) Just once, just once a week, somebody's saying, fight, fight, fight. No. There's this other person. No, no, I really still care about you. But like, why don't we work this thing out where I'll be with you Wednesdays and Sundays? And the rest of the week, man, I'm just going to go. I just got to do me for a little. I just need some space and time. Do you imagine how that would go for you? But, but there, was a, there was a company of people, maybe three families, that they had discipled their children in such a way that when a mandate went out across the nation that everyone was going to bow to a statue all of the trumpets, the leers, the, all of the instruments sound, and there are, you got to picture it, thousands bowing. This is the image. He's standing. Thousands bowing. In the distance, there is a group of three kids who refuse to bow. This is a prophetic picture of the forerunner ministry. Where it's not legalism, it's not religion, it's not striving. Be delivered from that. It's not any of those things. It's God raising up a company of people that are saying, no, we're going God's way. So then Nebuchadnezzar comes and he threatens him. You will bow or else. And then what's their response? With all due respect, bro, king, I'm not going to bow. So you do what you got to do. But I have resolved, even if you put me in the fire, I have confidence that the one I am serving is going to meet me there. Now, this all boils down to confidence because if you don't stand with a confident and steadfast heart, you will never go into the fire. You will always bow. This is not condescension. I'm not saying this in a condescending way. I'm trying to position us to when, when things happen, you all have an idea of what this looks like in your life. Whether it's the American dream or the lure of wealth 
or all of the different things that the enemy puts before you, there's always an opportunity to bow. But God is looking for people who would stand, who would gird themselves, who would stabilize their ways on God. Like Tyler says, your word, Lord, I have hidden in my heart that I, may not, that I may not, what does that mean? As I hide God's word in my heart, it stabilizes me to walk in purity and righteousness. It keeps me from sin. I don't read the Bible because I don't think I'm gonna go to heaven if I don't. I read the Bible because it has become living bread. It becomes our sustenance, our food. We begin to crave and desire it. We become hungry. It's not just hunger like you have right now. You probably had breakfast, a bagel, some coffee. You may be hungry, but the reality is you're like, bro, it's 12, stop. <laughs> hunger is desperation. When someone is hungry, it's aggressive. It's violent. That's what it said about John the Baptist. The violent take it by force. He was talking about the kingdom. It was violent. I don't know what it looked like in that day when John was on the scene, but I do know that a lot of people were offended by him. Jesus said, what did you think you came to see? A man dressed in fine linen? There was something about him that offended the social religious norm. The question we've got to ask ourselves is, is that you? I've heard people say things at times like, man, people at my job don't even know I'm a Christian. <laughs> what? I want to read to you Matthew 5. Matthew 5 says this about you. 14 says, this is actually our chapter for the week, and this is our verse. If you want to write it down, this is where we're going to chew on all week. Matthew 5, verse 14 says, you are, say, I am. I am. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. You cannot be hidden. Stop, say, law, pause. It is a command. You are, therefore, you cannot. It's not a choice. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. For no one puts a light, no one lights a lamp and puts it up under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. How many of you know that, like we sing in Acts 16, that the song of two delivered many? In Acts 16, when Paul and Silas, I don't know what everybody else in the jail was saying, but these jokers are crazy, bro. You are in jail. Shut up. I don't know what song they were singing, but how many of you know on the other side of that praise break, they were glad? I know there are people in the building, you're like, sorrow is in your heart. You're like, bro, I can't even vibe with what you're saying right now. On the other side of it, you're going to be glad that somebody talked to you about Matthew 24 and, and gave you the identity of being light of being something more than just a Christian. Someone who just plays the game. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill that cannot be hidden. This is your life. This doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. This doesn't mean you don't have deficiencies. But I just want to say to you, grace is there for that. Grace is not there for when you're alone on a Friday night and you watch porn. Grace is, grace is not there for when you're just going your own way. Grace is there for when you feel that moment of weakness. You say, Holy Spirit, I invite you in. I need your help. In my weakness, I need your help. Maybe you do make the mistake. Then you repent. The nasty old cuss word. You say, God, I turn. I'm sorry. I repent. You don't just make it words. You, you, you allow God to deal with your heart. Are you with me? So we're not just waiting for the right opportunity. I know in the world, many things are like ready, set, go. That is not the way of the kingdom, guys. The ways of the kingdom are opposite to the ways of the world. To live, you must. To receive, you must. It's all backwards. So if you're waiting for the right moment for like, I got to feel ready and then set so I can go. This is not the way. You watch Mandalorian, you're like, this is the way. This is not the way. The ways of the world do not appropriate to the ways of the kingdom. The gospel is a go gospel. Abraham, go. Where are we going? I'll show you. Moses, go. Deliver a people. How? I stutter. Go. Jesus is with the disciples for three years. They're like trying to figure this thing out. Go make disciples of all. Could you imagine hearing that from Jesus? 
all right, you got three years now. Go disciple the whole world. What? How? Go. No, wait. Wait in a room. Something's going to happen. It's a go gospel. It's not a ready. So, oh, now I feel set. I've got all my money. I've got all my donors. I've got all my... Go. You go. And as you go, he makes you ready. And as you're ready, then you will be set. You go. You trust. This is why it's so important. Not only... Praise the Lord. Can I do it? That'll end up on live stream somewhere. Me tripping. <laughs> Been there, done that. Not only do we steady our hearts on the going, what gives us the fuel. How many of you know your car is only good if you put gas in it? Yeah. Praise God you got a car. If you don't got money for gas, you're struggling. All the millennials and Gen Z is like, amen. <laughs> you on that $3 cash app deal. <laughs> One gallon at a time. Be delivered. What gives us the fuel to steady in the go is the word of the Lord. What's stable, this is why we're doing a chapter of the Bible. If I can get 52 chapters in you in a year, I have succeeded. For you understanding, man, I remember when Selah was born, all of the reports that came, when Selah was born, they were talking to us about aborting her, number one, which would have never happened, because they told us she has cystic fibrosis and she's gonna live only a certain amount of years all of the negative reports. How many of you know when that report starts happening, your heart starts sinking? I don't care how spiritual you are, bro. When that kind of stuff starts happening, your heart starts sinking. And now me and my wife are having to have conversations about, okay, so this is our girl that God promised. Let's just talk about worst case scenario. That she's with us for five to seven years. And we get to enjoy. These are the conversations we're having. Because just because you say yes to Jesus doesn't mean that nothing difficult is never going to happen. But what gave us stability in that season was we're not standing on the report of doctors and what things that are written on paper say. Let God be true and every man be a lie. Amen. Now that has to not just come out of here, it has to be in here. Where the word of the Lord becomes, this is the nature of a forerunner ministry. The word of the Lord sets the plumb line. It becomes the hard stop. I'm not going that way. I'm not living that way. I'm living according. Paul told Timothy this. For him to wage a good war according to what? Wage a war according to the prophetic words you have been given. Remember all of the things God has spoken to you because that will become weapons of warfare in the midst of adversity. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Some of you guys, you've got to go back to that journal 10 years ago and begin to feed yourself on his promises. Man, I know it's been a tough season. I know it's been difficult. I know it's very disorienting. But the word of the Lord is true. It is pure. It is clean. It washes us. He would say it corrects. It reproves. It does something. It divides soul from spirit. The word of the Lord is powerful. Say powerful. powerful. Is this making sense? Yes. Psalms 119.9 says this. How can a young man stay pure? Man, for all you young people in the room, all who are going to be here tonight, how can a young man keep his way pure? By obeying your word. Which means purity is not going to come by striving. I can't shaka baba boom you into purity. How can a young man stay pure by obeying your word? How can you obey something you don't know? This is an invitation into the secret place and saying, God, how many of you know, man, I read parts of this book even still and I'm like, I don't even know what that means. I say it to you on Sundays. I don't even know what that means. But it does something to my spirit. It brings life. It brings vibrancy. And for those of us, man, you think, well, whenever I get hungry, then I'll eat. That's not the way things work in the kingdom. In the kingdom, those who are full continue to eat. Meaning when I feel a lack of hunger, I'm not going to ask God, give me an impartation of hunger. I'm going to say, I know the path here. God, you have shown me. I've set my heart on the go, so I'm going to come to your word and I'm going to eat from this book. 
time and time and time again. Is this too basic for you? So many people waiting on a fresh new word from the Lord and God is saying, what have you done with what I've given you? It's the Matthew 25 parable of the talent. You've buried your talent. Why did he bury his talent? Because he was fearful. The fruit of him losing what he had given, it started with being fearful of the father, of the man who had given to him. So he said, just be delivered from that and take what you have and go. Let God multiply your loaves and fishes, whatever you've got, go. But live your life according to the word of the Lord. Let it, let it set the plumb line and refuse to, let pass, refuse to let life pass you by without seeing his glory. You know what the word of the Lord does? It keeps you childlike. You've got so many Christian experts. People who know everything about everything. It's like, man, the, I'll say it again. The people who were most prepared to receive Jesus missed him. Isn't that wild? That the people who read the scriptures, they stood up every week. They would have quoted it. They would have said it. They would have known. It would have been in them. There's still a risk of becoming religious in nature and missing the Lord in the midst of pursuing Christianity and the faith. I just want to ask you, when was the last time that you had like a wow God moment? Think about it. Not a Covington wow or a destiny wow. Like you in your life were like, wow. In this season, I believe by the grace of God, we'll close on a house on Wednesday. And, and, and I want to say this. This was a promise that God had given us. And for years, man, we have, we have given away from cars to savings. We have given, we've given. But in the midst of even that, meaning we had seed in the ground. How many of you know sometimes it's still hard to hope and believe when you can't see? Man, like November of last year, me and my wife were like, we don't even know if this is ever going to happen. And that you begin to see God do it for everyone else, which compounds. It's the nature of like the orphan thing. Every time somebody else is blessed, you feel like you're missing out. God's taking from you to give to them. And in this season, my spiritual father, as we were looking for a house, he said, Gio, you've only got to ask the Lord one question. The Lord says this, you've built him a house and he has built you a house. So the only question that you need to answer when you walk into a house is you have to ask the Lord, God, is this the house you've built for me? It's the only question. Nothing else matters. I'm like, yeah, things matter, bro. There's mortgage payments and there's, things matter. <laughs> it matters. You know, the kids walk into a million dollar like, wow, God. Thank you, Lord. Doesn't work that way. I've got an approval letter with a number on it. <laughs> but we walked into this house, and the moment we walked into it, we just felt like, oh, this is our house. But, but here's the deal. The AC was broken. All the appliances were all jacked up. We had to put money down for it. This is just real life. I just want to share with you real life right now. And we're like, this is uh, all the money we've got to put down, plus buy all new appliances, plus we don't have a washer and dryer, plus the AC is broken, all of these things. I called my spiritual, hey, man, I just want to run what did God say? Like, bro, just need some practical advice. If God says you just have to go, everything's going to work out along the way. Okay, so we signed the papers. All of our appliances jacked up. AC, within two days, all of the appliances were given to us brand new. The AC was paid for. Because the word of the Lord is true. Now this isn't, I don't want you to hear like, oh yeah, God would do that for Gio because this is, this is the voice that accuses every single one of us. <laughs> yeah, God, God would do it for Gio because oh, you're, you, do, you and Gio, no. For all of us, we go through difficulties and the question becomes, what did God say? Whether you're preaching multitudes and thousands or you're buying a home, in the height of spirituality or in the practicalities of day to day, what did God say? The word of the Lord becomes the plumb line. And this gives us fuel. Let me see what else I want to say to you. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just end here. Yeah. As God leads us into the new thing, charismatics love, yeah, the new thing. Ah! It's just who we are. 
It's interesting, God said, behold, I do, I do a new thing. Can you not see it? Can you not perceive it? Meaning in the midst of the new thing, some people won't be able to see what he's doing and some people won't understand it. But it springs forth still. The body of Christ is going through a deliverance right now. We just spoke about it. We spoke about all of the things, the, the, the consumer Christianity, the seeker friendly, all of these things. But in the midst of that, as God transitions us, many of you remember the people of Israel transitioning into a, from a season of bondage into the promised land. They cross over through the sea on dry ground. God provides manna. Could you imagine? Women in the room, you never have to cook a meal. It just falls to the ground. There's always enough. Your clothes, you never have to go shop at Kohl's, whatever, ever. You never go ever again. It just grows. I don't know why Kohl's. I don't know. I, don't, I never shopped at Kohl's ever. <laughs> ever. If you shop at Kohl's, this, is, this word's for you. Because I, I don't. <laughs> they never get sick. Could you imagine? Like, I never got to visit Dr. So-and-so. Like, nah, bro, I'm on Jesus' health care plan. God does this for 40 years, man. Like they're being provided. And then all of a sudden, they are transitioning into promise. Which I'm thinking like, yo, we saw the walls of Jericho fall down. Like we shouted and walls fell. Surely this next season is going to be glory to glory to glory. And then they move into the promise. And all of a sudden, bro, somebody comes out of their tent. You're like, yo, where's the manna? Somebody over here starts coughing, like, oh, COVID. <laughs> Do you understand that the, the dynamic changes? Like the guy, the, the kid who's like six and seven, his shirt's really tight. Like they used to just kind of have grow with like our clothes. As they shifted into the new season with God, everything shifted. And it did not look the way it looked in the past season. And I don't know how many people got offended by, they're not like, what, we've got to cook now? Do we have pots and pans? <laughs> like all of the things, like the, all of the things that, that happen as we shift with God and the nature of us, for all that we like to say God's doing a new thing, we get really comfortable in the old. Yeah. It becomes familiar. It becomes easy. We become settled. Therefore, when the new thing actually springs up, it's disruptive. It's uncomfortable. It stretches us. It's causing us to do things we've never done and sit with people. Man, I just feel like in this season, even people groups are changing. Meaning God will uproot you from a certain community and he'll implant you in a new one. It's like, but God, all of my friends and all of my, and God's like, man, I, I'm, stop saying I'm doing a new thing and prophesying it, but not stepping into it. Sometimes with the, even our change of, of people group must change in order for us to adapt and step into all that God has. What am I trying to say? To not resist the Lord's leadership in the birthing. I want to be very clear, very, very clear. God is coming with zeal to confront everything that hinders first love. I'm going to say it again. God in his zeal. How many of you ever seen a zealous person? That guy who just started dating that girl like a month ago. It's like, bro, that's gross. We we're sitting at an airport yesterday. There was two people sucking face. Like they must be dating. <laughs> I love my wife. Like she's my, I'm just not sucking face in New York City, JFK. Zeal. God with his zeal is coming to confront. Confrontational is not always great. Some of you love confrontation, but most of us don't. <laughs> He's coming to confront everything that hinders first love. Because a forerunner people cannot be hindered by things of the world. I said it last week when Paul was speaking, he says, hey, listen. You have been limited by your affections. I want to keep it before us. What's limiting you to the church of Corinth, what's limiting you is your affections. Young people, man, this is the season. If you're 35 and younger, younger, I just want to say, God is releasing his zeal to his people. I have so much faith that young and old, from the 100-year-old to the 15-year-olds, they're going to be all in for Jesus like never before. 
They're going to make any adjustments that are necessary to be made. They're going to give as God speaks. They're going to go. They're going to fast. They're going to pray. The things that we see as radical, man, think about this. We think that it's radical now when people are generous, when people pray, when people fast. Matthew 6, this is the, this is the DNA of a normal believer. Which raises the question, have we called revival what God calls normal Christianity? As God just stabilizes us back to the playing field, to normal zero, we're saying, revival. God's like, no. My people will always fast. They will always pray. They will always give. When you give, when you fast, when you pray. Because this type of person will go the distance. Will stand stabilized before the Lord. And we'll make way for others. The proof is in the pudding. In Daniel 3, when three young men stood in the midst of fire and there was a fourth man in the fire, the whole nation turned to God. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Three men standing in courage and boldness caused the heart of a king to turn and the nation to turn because just a few stood. And refuse to go the distance and stand. Let's stand. I want to spend just a few minutes here asking the Lord to awaken fresh awe and wonder. I want you to ask him just a few, five minutes here together. You've stretched your legs. We'll let you go. Some of you can go to Kohl's. <laughs> There's something there for you. We're asking the Lord to awaken fresh desire. Man, I want to be with you. Do you hear what I'm saying? We want to be together as a spiritual family knowing that we are those company of people that God is speaking about in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, 25 would have been the foolish versions and the wise versions. We want to be in that narrative. We want to say, no, we've heard about this. It's been spoken about. We want, we're, this is a time to get oil. This is a time to stabilize. So let's just wait for just a moment before the Lord here. Some of you can just begin to pray. We just got to get good, of it, good at this, man. Just corporately waiting on the Lord and praying and crying out. Father, we're asking you to awaken and liberate our hearts. We thank you that you hear us. You hear us and you respond to our prayers. Psalm 102 says you regard the prayer of the destitute. We're asking you, God, to mark us with the forerunner spirit. Like John the Baptist, those that would live a radical lifestyle, that would go contrary to the grain, not just for the sake of being different, but for the sake of the gospel. God, you're not looking for perfect, talented people. You're looking for available people, open-hearted, willing people, just for someone with a yes. So God, we ask you for grace across the room to go all in. No more people on the fringes, God, even for those upstairs. In the upper room, God, touch them. Mark them. Release your zeal. God, become more and more real to us. Let your word penetrate our hearts. Awaken us to first love. Confront every lesser lover. Every sin issue. Every side issue. Every distraction, God. Would you break shame and guilt and mourning, heaviness? We even received a word about people coming in with deep grief. Father, we just ask for grace for those who have been going through seasons of grieving and pain. We thank you that you are near to those with a broken heart, those with contrite spirits, for those caring that God is near. He gives beauty for mourning, joy for ashes. There's praise available for heaviness. Amen. 
I want to make space here really quickly. If there's anybody in the room that you're like, man, I have some stuff in my life. I need to repent and get right with the Lord. We just always want to make space for people to turn their hearts back to Jesus. Today is the day of salvation. There's no better time than now to do business with Jesus and accept grace. So if that's you, you're in the room, you're like, man, I've got some stuff I need to turn. If you just raise up your hand right now, we can pray for you as a family. I have some stuff in my heart. It's good. Good, good, good. Yeah. Anyone else? Just keep your hand up. We're gonna, we're gonna pray for you right here. If there's somebody next to you, let's just, let's just put the hand. There's a couple right here. Anybody else? We just wanna pray. There ain't no shame right over here. There's somebody right over here. Let's just pray as a family, man. This is a beautiful moment. It's holy. God cares about that pain. God cares about that. We just, we just, every lie that God doesn't care or that He is distant, has separated Himself from you. We thank you, Father, for grace and mercy. It says, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Father, we thank you for grace to turn, to receive your love. We confess all around, all around the room, we confess of falling short in different places. We're not afraid of, a, of approaching the throne room of grace because we need it. So Father, we ask for great grace and blessing to be poured out on these ones, even now, that your love would be poured out. Holy Spirit, come and fill them with your delight and your affirmation, God. That your love had cast out all fear, all pain. Grace to forgive even betrayal. People and wrongdoings. Every weight, God, be lifted off of your children. Just a few more minutes, church. Just a few more minutes. Oh, there was a young lady over here who we prayed for earlier. Young lady, I really felt like whenever we were praying that, that the Lord, I just kept hearing the Lord say, did I not say? Have I not spoken? And that the, the Lord, He is reigniting these words and these promises He's given to you. I even feel like maybe even 10 years back where the Lord has spoken some specific things, that'd be 2013 now. The Lord spoke some specific things to your heart and it hasn't all played out the way that you thought. And I just heard like, have I not said, is my word not alive? I just, I just wanna pray and bless. Father, we just ask you like Ezekiel 37 to blow upon those places that seem desolate. It's for anybody in the room, any, for places that feel desolate. Ezekiel said, how can these dry bones live? And he said, prophesy to those bones. So Lord, we prophesy to every space and place in your life that seems empty and seems desolate. And I just feel like the Lord loves your faith. He loves your pursuit. It's the Shulamite. He delights. It's, it's the lean. There's a grace. And the Lord sees and the Lord hears you. And He delights in you. That's real. It's, 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 you feel like it's weak, but it's real. So Father, we just bless her right now. We ask for fresh zeal, fresh desire. God, every dream, we, we silence every voice of accusation, every word that has been spoken due to misunderstandings from people that did not have the grace to see in you what's in you. We just speak grace. God, would you heal every wound, even from ministries and people who are supposed to cover we ask you, God, for grace to trust you on the journey. We just declare that who is that leaning on her beloved? It's you. There's grace to lean. We ask for healing at a soul level. You're not making things up in your mind and you're not reaching. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. The word of the Lord proves true. His promises are yes and amen to a thousand generations. 
We speak to every barren area. Every area of barrenness, Father, we ask that you would produce the Hannah cry. That what is produced from this season of barrenness, that not one, this is what was said of Samuel, not one word from his mouth fell to the ground. Really quickly, I want to pray for any that burn with the forerunner. You're like, man, that's me. I'm that company. That is I. I just want to just come forward real quick. We just want to pray and bless you. Just even together, if it's just a few, it's fine. It's not about numbers, it's just agreement. Just all across, we're just going to pray in agreement together. I'm just going to, for two minutes, cry out to the Lord. Together, Father, in Jesus' name, we're asking you to make of us this company of people, God. In the midst of difficulty and darkness and turning and apostasy and all of the things, God, we're asking you to create in us a steady and confident and steadfast heart. May your word become food for us. No more separation of word and spirit, God. Marry us to your word. Create a zeal and a hunger and a desire and a burning and a passion. Let the fire in Jeremiah burn in us. It's not hype. It's real. You're raising up a people that will linger. They will wait like Joshua in the tent of meeting. We will wait for you there, God. Use us in any way you see fit. Send us to the nations. Send us to the streets. Send us to the stores. Use us in our houses, God. Raise up priests in homes. Raise up mothers and fathers and sons. God, here at 913 Dubloom, hear our cry. We've seen what you have said, and we will be those who will go the distance. Let it be by the grace of God. Let it be by the grace of God. No man left on the outside. This is for all. This is for all. We're asking, we're seeking, we're knocking. Release the spirit of prayer upon your church. God, we pray for all of those that just pray right now for those that feel on the outside, God. Would you bring them into the family in a deeper way? All shame and condemnation would go. Oh God. Raises up like John the Baptist, a peculiar people. The Nasherites, the Nazarites. Those who would burn for consecration. Sound the alarm. Clear the streets. Make way for the King of glory to enter in. Let that be, God, the word of the Lord over our lives. Let crooked paths be made straight. Let there be highways in the wilderness. Oh, I just feel this, man. For those of you that are dealing with prodigals who you know God has risen to be to be to be forerunners and God, there is an assignment of the enemy on their life. This is not demonizing that person because that was that. If that's you, would you just raise up your hand? We're going to pray right now. Just if you have someone that's far, if you know there's an assignment, it should be every mom and dad, but I'm saying this forerunner call. If there's somebody next to you, we just want to pray. My staff, raise up the hand high so we know how to pray. Reach around you. If there's someone next to you, we want to pray for these right now. Father, we want to pray for every prodigal, for every son and daughter, God, that has, been, that has been in a place of abandonment and desperation, that have turned to all the wrong things, God. We ask that you close every door. Let every door be closed to wickedness. And God, let the word of the Lord spring up and out of every prodigal, of every son, of every daughter. We refuse every negative testimony. I'm so, Father, would you, would you just wipe away every word of condemnation and shame over them right now? Holy Spirit, we say go in power and love. Would your word perform? 
Even now, send your ministering angels. Break addiction. Break anger. Break pride. Break the orphan spirit. We thank you that in this next coming move, you're going to use these and those. I prophesy to you that those who seem like the least likely will be the most likely. We agree with the Holy Spirit that you are raising up a company of people. We say even now that those who have been trained up in the ways of the Lord will not depart. We break off shame even off mothers and fathers that say you should have done a better job. We break off shame right now in Jesus' name. The word of the Lord is bigger, greater, stronger than any parental lack. We speak life over them. Life. Abundant John 10.10 10, overflow life. For every negative word they have received, Father, let there be five words of, of the Lord be released over them. Oh man, I just feel like God is canceling those assignments. Father, raise up prophets. Let the prophetic spirit be released. Raise up prophets that would walk in purity, that would hold fast to your word. Hey, Pete and Maya, is Mackenzie still here? I felt like I have a word for you, you Tom and Mackenzie. I felt like the Lord really directly wanted, wanted us to recognize you guys. Can someone run and grab her really quickly? Father, we just thank you for what you're doing in this room, Lord. We recognize that you are calling out others, Father, and it's your word that's going forth. It's not our word, but Lord, it's your word because you care about your children. You so care about your children and their desires. Father, so right now, we just thank you for raising up a remnant people who are not afraid to go to places that have never been before. Father, who have their ear turned towards heaven, listening, listening for your voice. We will not go our own way, Father. We will follow your cloud, your pillar of fire, Lord. We will be obedient. We will be obedient, Father, that where you go, we will go. Where you go, we will go, Father. We will walk hand in hand with you and we will not be ashamed. Lord, we will not be ashamed to be the different people, the odd ones out, Father. We don't care what it looks like, Lord. We're willing to pay the cost. Whatever the cost, we'll buy the field. We will buy the field because we know that you are the treasure. We know that you are the treasure. Jesus, we will grab hold of you like the woman with the issue of blood. Father, would you give us a tenacity to grab hold? Father, to not let go. We're not going to let go. We're not afraid of wrestling, Lord. We're not afraid, Father, to call out and say, Son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David, have mercy on us. Because we know when we grab hold, we're grabbing hold of a person, not just a thing, not just an ethereal spirit, Lord. We we are grabbing a hold of you, Jesus, and we've got to have you. I wish someone would help me pray. We've got to have you, Jesus. We've got to have you. We need you. Our lives need you. I need you for my mothering. I need you for my children's sake. I need you for my workplace, Lord. I have got to have you, Father. Let us go all the way. Let us go all the way. Um, last night I woke up in the middle of the night and I got the word motor home and um, I, I didn't actually understand what a motor home is. I thought it was a workshop like where you fix cars and <laughs> I'm like motor home, motor home and then this morning the Lord reminded me motor home and then I saw it's an RV right 
And I just felt, even just with a message, that um, Disney was just praying now about selling everything for the poor. And I just wanted to put it out there that maybe the Lord has spoken to someone here this morning to, to really sell everything and to purchase a motorhome and to go. And so if that's you, I just felt like I needed to be obedient, that the Lord reminded me again three times just to say motorhome. And there would be someone that would say, yes, that's a confirmation, because we know that's a big step. So we just agree with you this morning in the commissioning and in the going. Amazing. Yeah, Tom, I know she's, she finally made it. <laughs> can I have Pastor Tyler, can you go play, uh, pray over Tom and Mackenzie real quick? I just saw you guys from across the room and the Lord highlighted you so clearly. Um, and he said that he has set you both apart for the work of the ministry. And it, I, I don't know what it's looked like in your journey, but I felt the Lord say strongly, I have set you to remind them that I have set them apart for the work of the ministry. And to remind you of the things that are of old, that things that he spoke to you a long time ago that were old and that have just maybe not come to pass. But he said, I have set you guys apart and it's not to look like anything else, anything else that anyone else has done. I feel like he's given you guys such creative insight into ministry that it's gonna look different. You're gonna talk different. You're gonna act different, but it's because he has equipped you to be different. So Father, right now, we just recognized your hand on this couple and on this family. Father, we recognize the hand of God on this family. We recognize the pure hand of God on this family. And I even feel the need to repent for people not recognizing the hand on you. Like they didn't, they didn't recognize it for the fullness that it was there. But the Lord said, it was my hand upon you especially you, Tom, it was my hand upon you. And I'm sorry that they mishandled you because they could not recognize it was my hand. But right now, Lord, we just recognize that this is your hand. This is your hand. That you didn't manipulate your way in, you didn't make your way in, but Father, you opened doors, you opened doors over their lives. And so as a ministry right now, we just say yes. We say yes and amen to the, that they are set apart for the work of the ministry. I just see you guys being so vital and instrumental that the Lord was like, literally like you are consecrated instruments for his use. And so we just say yes, Father, right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for restoring. Yeah, I even sense like this like real prophetic gift and the Lord's like, I'm restoring that gift that may have been shut off. I'm opening it again. Father, we thank you for the ability to have ears to hear and even see. I don't know which one of you see, but I feel like the Lord has shown you things like creative things, just different things. You see things so differently. And I believe the Lord is restoring that even now, even like it's going to be double. It's gonna be double for you guys. And we just recognize it right now in the name of Jesus. Let's just lift up our hands and we'll end like this. God, you have our yes. We make a fresh commitment all across this room. You have our yes. Our yes looks different. Everybody's yes looks different. But we give you our yes. From our staff, God, to our spiritual family, to our elders, we give you our yes. Our lives are yours. You spend us however you'd like, God. We want to be a part of the end time company. No hype. It doesn't have to be, there's no hype. It's real. We love you and we want to be used by you and we want to help people encounter you. So you have our yes. Just tell them that you have my yes. You have my yes, God. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to understand your work in this time. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We love you guys. You're welcome to stay. If God's ministering to you, please, if you could just respect what God's doing around the altar. If you want to have conversations, we're, if anybody needs prayer, we're here to pray with you. We would love anybody that needs prayer. We are here. We love you guys. We'll see you in prayer room throughout the week. If not, next Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. Bless you, bless you, bless you.